And now to introduce today's speaker, uh, Olga peters Hasty is professor, professor of Russian literature in Princeton University's Slavic department. She is a co-author of America Through Russian Eyes and the author of Sveteva's Orphic Journeys and the Worlds of the Word, Pushkin's Tatiana, which received the Help Prize for Best Book by Woman, and How Women Must Write, Inventing the Russian Woman Poet, which was awarded the Help Prize for Best Book in Women's and Gender Studies. So with that, I will turn it over to Olga. Good afternoon, hello. Um, thank you for that nice uh, introduction and for inviting me to come to this, uh, to this lecture series. Thank all of you for being here. I'm sorry I can't see anyone that we can't be in the same room together, but this is certainly, we're lucky we have at least this option to be able to communicate. So my talk today in a way I could say is a place where history month of March meets poetry March of April. And uh, I'll be taking everyone on a romp through Russian cultural history in the beginning of the 20th century in Russia, so the 19th century in Russia, and along a trail that will eventually lead us to the main attraction, which is a scandal. This is a scandal that has no sex in it, but it does have gender and politics. Uh, the material is from, for this talk is based on my most recent book in which I wanted to see um, not only what impediments aspiring women uh, encountered, aspiring women poets encountered in the early 19th century, but also to see what kinds of solutions they came up with. In other words, what kinds of strategies that did they develop to, uh, be, to be able to enter this inhospitable terrain in order to establish themselves in the Russian poetic tradition? Now, um, the... Uh, in particular, the forced marriage scandal that we'll look at today allows us to see the success of one such strategy, um, but also the serious vulnerabilities it incurred. Now, the title of the book and of the talk today, uh, How Women Must Write, uh, refers to a poem by the poet that we'll be talking about today. I'm going to inter introduce her in just a moment, so don't worry. Um, the title of her poem is How Women Must Write, and what I liked about it is that the word must, the two meanings of word must, ideally capture two very broad categories of um, things that women were up against as they tried to write poetry. The first one, of course, is must in its meaning of compunction. This is how you must write. This is how you have to write. This is what you can write about. This is what you can't write about. So must in that sense. But then there's also the other meaning of must, which is speculative. It's, um, it's the meaning of must that says, oh, you're a woman, you must be thinking X, Y, Z. You're a woman, oh, you must mean X, Y, Z. So that women were constrained not only in what they were writing about, what they could write about, but also in how they were read. And we'll see both of those things at play in the scandal that we'll talk about today. Now, the scandal involves, um, we'll be considering an in, how an inflammatory political poem got past two arch conservative editors, two rounds of government censorship to appear in a reactionary daily paper that had ties with the secret police. This is quite a coup. Uh, but before we get there, um, with the scandal will, will allow us to see um, in action women's strategies that use gender to get her poem into print, but also the vulnerabilities and the problems that came with that. So I'd like to give you a brief overview of the talk because we'll be romping around in different places, just so you have a, a, a sort of bit of a map. Um, first, I'll, I'll start out with some background material. I'll set the stage with a brief sketch of poetry and power in Russia in the first half and into the mid, mid 19th century. And this will provide some, I hope, helpful context for the body of the talk, which is then the scandal and the aftermath to which we'll turn. Um, I'll then also see our poet through to her death in 1858. And then if time allows, um, I'll offer a very brief coda that will take us for a moment into early 20th century Russia, but I'll only do that if, I'll only do that if there's time because I'm especially looking forward to receiving questions and discussions, comments from the floor. So let's start with poetry. As we look at the first three decades of the 19th century, we see before us the golden age of Russian poetry. These are two of its most famous proponents whose names are probably familiar to all of you, Alexander Pushkin and Mikhail Lermontov. Um, this is the romantic period, of course, 
And it's important to bear in mind that Romanticism was seen as an expressly masculine poetic movement. It was a, the poetry was aligned with male sexuality, which made it a genre deemed unsuitable for women. Additionally, Romantic poets took great interest in national identity, liberation of subjugated peoples. We have only to think of Lord Byron uh, fighting in the Greek War of Independence against the Ottoman Turks, against the Ottoman Empire, so that you get a sense of that. Um, this too is not something appropriate for women. Moreover, the genre of poetry also had, uh, was recognized to have political significance. Again, not suitable for women. Poems have so many ways to generate meaning, as we know, whether it's literal, figurative, analogical, by association, and so on. And a poem can signify at a variety of levels at the same time in very highly condensed form. It's a small form, relatively speaking, compared to War and Peace, for sure. Um, easy to copy out, easy to circulate, to memorize, to recite in private gatherings, and as such, it possessed an enviable potential for eluding censorship of forbidden context, content, content, or ideas. Accordingly, the government censors kept a very wary eye on poets and subjected their works to close scrutiny. Now, I will never sit here and say that censorship is a good thing. It's not. It's problematic in all the ways I don't have to recite to you now. But it does have one outcome, and that's that it really trained poets to write very carefully. They learned how to slip things past the censorship to their readers, who for their part, learned to be very good at reading between the lines. So this government constraint had the very un unintended consequence of leading to the development of a highly skilled set of writers and of readers who were ve well practiced at reading between the lines. Now, the diligence of the government censorship makes it clear that poetry mattered and that the regime took care to keep it in check. Needless to say, we see, we see this again in the Soviet regime, the idea that poetry really mattered. We have the number of dead poets, poets that died in Stalin's, Stalin's times, uh, sort of being very tragic proof of that. Now, one thing is one thing when poets praise monarchs and another thing entirely when they called for change in familiar socio-political structures as the romantics were inclined to do. In fact, Nicholas I himself famously took on the role of being Pushkin's um, uh, private censor, censoring his poems. Now, in this culture, women were acknowledged not as poets, but they were acknowledged as readers. The restrictions placed on their actual experience made them turn to books more and more to be able to vary their lives and gain access to areas they didn't have access to uh, directly. They, were also, they could also be hostesses of salons where uh, poetry, where the arts could thrive. And they could write verses and albums. This was, of course, very popular. You exchanged albums, wrote little uh, verses for each, you know, either your own composition or a poem you liked into each other's. Um, uh, albums, but they were not allowed to be publishing poets. Now, in the late 1830s and early 1840s, we begin to see a bit of a shift as the aristocracy very gradually loses its hegemony over the arts. Meanwhile, a mixed class of intellectuals emerge calling for civic-minded prose, social criticism, naturalism, and assigns an increasingly pragmatic role to literature, so the aesthetics giving way to pragmatics. This meant that by the eight, early 1840s, the Romantic movement was getting a little wobbly. Major poets of the Golden Age were dead, and if you could see the, the tragic dates of the two poets up on the screen, um, testify to the fashion of dueling that was still very much in practice at that time, even though it was forbidden. Um, anyway, the, um, the followers of these great poets seemed weaker now. It was no longer the pinnacle of the golden age and civic-minded prose was on the rise. Now, as romanticism lost its energy, its momentum, its drive, the male poetic establishment came to be more accepting of aspiring women poets. You know, any kind of ally is a good thing. So this gained women a toehold in the poetic tradition, but just as it was waning. What women could and couldn't do continued to be restricted by social norms, a lack of formal educational opportunities, and various limits placed on their experience, whether it's fashions that impeded their freedom of movement, 
or the prohibition against appearing in public without an escort. Um, this is not unique to Russia, and I can't help uh, provide one vignette from France. Uh, Georges Sand, who was wildly popular in Russia at just this very time, uh, you, as we know, dressed in male attire so that she could move through the streets of Paris freely and unobserved. Now, other women thought saw this uh, her freedom of movement thought this was a great idea and similarly started emulating her so they could walk around in the streets and not, not attract unwanted attention. Um, it got to the point where in, in Paris, uh, women who wanted to do that had to apply for a license and get a license to wear male clothing so that they could walk through the streets. This didn't happen in Russia, but Georges Sand was very popular. Now, apart from being a vignette, my mention of Sand reminds us of the increasing politic politicization of the woman and her place in society in Russia at this time, which complicated things for flesh and blood women. So these abstract notions of women being politicized and then women themselves, which, which had to deal with it. Now in this setting, we see that aspiring women poets could respond in two broadly, two broad categories to the restrictions imposed under to the gender biases that they worked under. First of all, they could, of course, play it down in their poetry. They could play down the fact they were women. They could, for example, avoid grammatical references to gender. They could use masculine pronouns. They could just avoid gender altogether. Um, they could also, how they presented in society, they could refuse to act frivolous and dress up and say they enjoyed balls. They could make a point of seeming scholarly, serious, um, and well-read. The other way was to play up conventional femininity in society, to act, to dress up and say, enjoy balls and act frivolous, but as a way to detract attention from the fact that they were breaking with gender norms by writing and publishing poetry. So both of these categories offered advantages, but they also incurred new vulnerabilities that made the complicated things. All right, so now let's move on to power. Uh, Nicholas I was on the throne determined to maintain the status quo on which his own authority rested, and this included maintaining traditional gender roles. You can see in his title, it's pretty long, I had barely enough room to squeeze it in, Russian history sort of condensed in that title. Well, first of all, Emperor of Russia, um, the, the title Emperor replaced Tsar in the latter part of the reign of Peter the Great, and it reflects Russia's imperial aspirations and a determination to be seen on par with European nations. Skip over, skip over to Finland. Finland was annexed to the Russian Empire in the uh, Finnish War of 1808-1809 and remained that way until 1917. And the middle part, which is, gonna actually, is relevant to what I'm talking about today, King of Poland. Now, um, in late November of 1830, marked the Polish Revolution. This again, still under Nicholas's reign against Russian domination, Russian domination that had been established in the Congress of Vienna in 1815 in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars. This Polish revolution was not, Russia bungled it. It took an entire year to suppress it. And pretty much 1830 to 1831 was an all out war in which Poland was finally reconquered and lost what autonomy it still enjoyed. Its constitution was replaced by a statute that made Poland an indivisible part of the Russian Empire. Nicholas I was skittish by the Decemberist revolt with which his own reign began, by the waves of European revolutions, by the new currents of thought coming in from Europe and entering Russia, and all the more eager to secure things as they were. He saw his authority rooted in patriarchy, autocracy, and imperialism, and we see him emerge um, as the policeman of Russia and the gendarme of Europe. I'm sure you've heard those uh, before. Well, now I think the stage is sufficiently set. It's time to let our leading lady finally make her appearance. Here she is. Yevdekia uh, Sushkova lost her mother at the age of six um, and grew up in Moscow in her maternal grandfather's family. Uh, she was bright, intelligent, an avid reader, and a polyglot. Besides the Russian and French, of course, all people of her circles knew. She also taught herself German, Italian, and English. And the epigraphs, just the epigraphs to her poems testify to wide reading in, in various languages and from various literary traditions. 
Now, her poetic debut occurred very early when she was only 20 years old in 1831, and it happened without her knowing it. Her friend, the poet Vazinsky, took what liked one of her poems, took it without asking her, and without asking her, published it in an almanac that he edited. Well, when her family saw her name appear in this almanac under that particular poem, they were furious. This indecent public appearance of the young lady outraged them and she was instructed very severely not to disgrace the family name in the future. She complied. In 1833, she married, she did continue writing quietly without telling them that was bad enough um, and she still didn't publish. But in 1833, she married Count Andrei Rostopchin um, who is the wealthy son of the former Moscow commander in chief, who, as lore has it, was the one who set fire to Moscow at the approach of Napoleon's army. So um, now she's married, it makes it a little bit easier. She doesn't have your parents and not to disgrace her family name, so she's got a new name now. Um, she continues writing and begins timidly to publish in various journals, often signing her, her poems with just initials. Um, and then gradually, as she got to be known, signing her full name, her full married name, I should say. So the couple alternated between a pretty lively social life in Moscow and quiet times in their family country estate where she had her three children. The whole time she kept writing, published in individual journals, um, almanacs, papers. Um, when in 1836, the family moved to Petersburg, the Countess was warmly received in society and in literary circles. She led, a, again, a vigorous social life, and here she hosted a very renowned literary salon that was frequented by leading cultural figures of the time, both Russian and from abroad. She was also a first-rate poet. Her poems show a remarkable variety in subject matter, and a consummate mastery of a really broad range of poetic forms. She just did it very well. Major poets of the day recognized this, dedicated verse to her. Um, her own poetry was published often side by side with theirs and received favorable critical notice. She knew Lermontov and Pushkin well, uh, as well as other major poets of the time. Now, her recognition as a, as a poet then, just to summarize, uh, was secured by the fact that she was a wealthy countess, that certainly helped. She was the hostess of a very prominent salon. Her social skills were widely touted as being superb and by the quality of her verse, but also because of the strategy uh, she used, which was to foreground her convention, conventional femininity in her behavior and in society that was sort of, um, as she entered, sort of Take, take attention away from the fact that by entering the poetic arena, she was in fact challenging stereotypical gender norms. So her first collection of poetry came out in 1841 under a you know, fairly generic title, Poems of Countess Ia Stepchina, and received largely favorable notice from critics. In 1845, she and her family set out on a two-year tour of Europe. And this brings us now closer to this famous scandal I've been dangling in front of everybody's eyes. So um, as she set out in this two-year trip, she continued writing poems and she even published, which is where we begin now, the meaty part of the paper. December 17th, 1846 edition of the Northern Bee, a daily political and literary newspaper um, published in St. Petersburg, carried three of her poems. This is just a page from one of the editions, not, not the one with her poems on it. One of these three poems that were published in this, in this publication was called A Forced Marriage, Nesilni Brak, that she composed in September of the previous year, that is in 1845, having just visited Krakow. The ballad presents a dispute between an old baron and his wife that his servants and vassals are invited to come and hear out and to judge fairly. So the first half of the poem, the baron has his say. He complains, he says that he extended his patronage over his orphaned wife um, and uh, pr pr provided her with wealth, provided her with luxury and personally stood guard over her to protect her from her enemies. In response to these magnanimous gestures, as he maintains, his wife maligns him far and wide and behaves in a treacherous manner. Meanwhile, the Baron tells us, 
The Baron's enemies derive pleasure from his discomfiture and egg his wife on to further insubordination. Each of the four stanzas of his complaints ends with a line. I've got each, these are the lines that end each of the four stanzas that show his heightened displeasure. So it's my rebellious wife, ungrateful wife, my perfidious wife, my criminal wife. So in the second half of the poem, the wife has her say. She complains of the harsh, exceedingly harsh restrictions her husband places on her. She describes her as a vassal who thirsts for vengeance on the baron who forbids her the use of her language. He prevents her from taking pride in her ancient lineage and prevents her from uh, observing the rights of her faith. She bemoans the loss of her servants and bridles under the oppression she endures at the hands of the people she, that her husband has watching over her. Under such circumstances, she asserts, she has very good reason to complain and can scarcely remain silent. So her four lines look like this. I'm a prisoner and not a wife. I am his enemy and not his wife. Unfortunate wife, a wife taken by force. Well, poetry, as I said before, has this marvelous capacity to signify at different levels simultaneously. And this ballad could be read variously. First of all, everyone, you know, gossip, gossip, gossip. Everyone knew that uh, Rostopchina's own personal relations with her husband were less than satisfying um, and thought that this was probably a poem about her personal life. At the same time, since the ballad appeared just when Georges Sand was at the height of her popularity in Russia, many readers saw it as being a statement against the institution of mat matrimony in general in, in a uh, concert with Sand uh, recommended. Now there is yet one more way in which the poem signified and Fade Bulgarin, the founder and editor of this publication found himself in extremely hot water when the poem won scandalous notice as an allegory of Russia's repressive treatment of Poland. Now we have to marvel that Stipchina had the audacity to submit this poem to the Northern Bee and Marvel still more, still more, still more that it was actually published in that paper. The thing is that the Northern Bee was an arch conservative, not to say reactionary, literary and political newspaper that had ties with, with, with what was officially called the third section of his Imperial Majesty's own chancellery, which is a fancy way of saying the secret police. Bulgarian was a reactionary journalist, an editor and writer and a police informer. So how did this subversive poem make its way into this publication and especially past the editor who had ties with secret police and who was a staunch supporter of Nicholas I's authoritarian practices, including Russia's stronghold on Poland? Well, to begin with, the poem arrived from Italy, which has very pleasant associations, so that seemed nice. Restruction as high position in society was doubtless um, also a factor. Beyond that, though, Restriptiona knew what she was doing and acted strategically. She sent the offending ballad together in a cluster of other poems so it didn't stand out quite as much. She removed the epigraph, let me weep over my hard fate and let me sigh for my freedom from Handel's opera, Rinaldo. And of course, she removed all the overt references to, Pol to Poland, specifically the note that she had written this poem en route from Krakow to Vienna. And secondly, most importantly, her dedication of this poem to the great, great, great Polish romantic poet, Adam Mickiewicz and singer of the singer of freedom who promoted Polish independence and whose poetry was known to inspire uprisings. But even without these overt references to Poland that Rostopchina removed, the political allegory couched in the domestic uh, grievances that the poem describes were very close to the surface and not that difficult to see, especially given that we're talking about practice censors uh, and readers. Simply leaving out those references to Poland is hardly enough to disguise the political import of the poem. This is all the more true that since in 1846, 1846 was the year, that's the year in which the poem actually was published, also marked the year of the Krakow uprising which was a vivid reminder of Poland's plight and desire for freedom. Now, in order to camouflage the subversive uh, content of the poem, 
Mr. Chana played up her femininity, skillfully turning preconceived notions about gender to her own advantage. The letter that accompanied uh, her poems, uh, the letter to Bukhara that, that accompanied her poems, breathed feminine modesty. She said, oh, just don't put me, please publish my poems, but don't put my name on them. I want them published anonymously. I'm just, we'll just publish them anonymously. Don't, don't put my name, don't put my name. It also included lavish accolades to the Northern Bee and its editor. We know that of course, flattery will get you just about anything you want. Um, so give, I'll give you just a little taste so you have a sense of the flavor of the letter. And I'll I quote English translation. With all assurances of my esteem, I ask you to accept the expression of my wishes that success ever and everywhere reward your estimable efforts on behalf of our literature, as well as the services of your long-standing and inexhaustible talent, which every Russian recognizes. Well, now, Bulgarin was somebody who sided with the dominant group, sucked up to power, censored literature, informed on people to the secret police, and was himself a very indifferent writer. So he was much more likely to attract the very sharp barbs of epigrams that poets of the time wrote to him and encounter all kinds of rather unpleasant words applied to him. And things like viper and reptile were not unfamiliar to him as Lanchin. But here, this um, praise, that was dripping with irony. He saw only honey and just loved being praised as he thought and um, was very gratified by this. So this also helped get the poem into print. But above all, I think he was blinded by his assumption that like women themselves, their poems were to be taken at face value and required only a superficial reading. In keeping with prevailing constructs of gender, he simply did not believe that women knew how to conceal anything between the lines of their poems or that they could or would, or would write politically subversive poetry. Dostopchina exploited these biases and Bulgar biases. Bulgarin published not only the allegorical ballad and two of the other poems she sent him, but also the letter that she wrote to him that was full of praise for him. And he prefaced it with his own very extra extravagant praise of the Countess. And here's a little taste of what that sounded like. He wrote of, of the quote, the lofty talent, the tender feelings, the elevated ideas, the sweet language and the primary property of genius, the key to the human heart, especially to the inscrutable heart of a woman. It has been ages and ages since such sweet sounds have been heard in our orphaned Russian poetry. For a long time now, our poetry has not been warmed by such kindly feelings as are contained in these verses born under the charming sky of Italy. Well, whatever the charms of the sky of Italy, the sky over Bulgarin's head darkened ominously when Emperor Nicholas was recognized in the old baron and Poland was recognized in the wife of the Stipchina's poem. Nicholas conveyed his wrath to the unhappy Bulgarin and his co-editor -co Nikolai Gretsch via the chief of the secret police. Gretsch immediately threw Bulgarin under the bus. He said, well, Bulgarin's the one accepted the poem for publication, I didn't. Um, moreover, Gretsch went on to say, I don't even like poetry and poetry written by women is especially a detestable. I don't like it at all, I mean, you know, it's not my fault. He went on to explain that he took the poem at face value because he never dreamed that a woman could, and especially one of her class, would be capable of such perfidy. He also pointed out that the allegorical meaning he and Bulgarin had missed had also evaded two rounds of government censorship. Now to explain the two rounds of government censorship, anytime something was published, say in a, in a journal, a publication such as the Northern Bee, first each piece was sent individually to the censor's office who approved it. And then when the entire um, issue was assembled, it went through censorship yet again. It's actually very astute because you can take two very innocent things, you take innocent pieces and put them in a context range in the way that could potentially have seditious content. So both of these killer uh, editors and the two, two rounds of government censorship just went right past what was pretty obvious allegory in this poem. Um, so Bulgarin's position was all the more precarious because he was of Polish extraction. He too vehemently protested his innocence of the poem's political dimension. Um, he went on to insist that it was a mistake to see Nicholas and the Baron and Poland and the wife. 
because it wasn't a political allegory, but if you were to read it as a political allegory, it'd be much more reasonable to see the poem showing Baron Austria in argument with his wife, Italy. Um, that did not get him off the hook and Bulgarian was subjugated to humiliating interrogation. But so many, again, since the poem had slipped through past so many people, uh, so many experienced people, he actually escaped severe punishment, the punishment as severe as he might've gotten otherwise. Nicholas was furious and threatened to shut down the Northern Bee altogether, but allowed its, its publication to continue after copies carrying the offending poem were seized and destroyed. Bulgarian was made to be aware of additional government pressure on editorial policies. Um, and, therefore, and after that came a flurry of poems that took unruly wives to task written by individuals who curried favor with the emperor. Meanwhile, the offending poem itself circulated um, in manuscript, appeared in Russian publications abroad and was celebrated by liberals who were very impressed by Rostopchina's daring defense of Poland and delighted at Bulgarian's acute embarrassment. So we see the gender stereotyping blinded experienced editors and censors alike to the allegorical meaning of Rostopchina's ballad. A poem like this by a male poet could never have made it into print. And I don't think any male poet would have ever sent it to the Northern Bee to try to publish it. So the step tonight again succeeded in turning feminine stereotyping to her own advantage, but this was a mixed blessing at best. For all the anger that, that the emperor vented on Bulgarin, uh, the brunt of his displeasure fell quite predictably on the author of the poet, poem herself. Um, when in 1847, almost, it was almost a year after the poem appeared in print, Dostopchina returned to St. Petersburg from her European voyage. She was made to understand that she was no longer welcome at court and forced to remove herself from the capital to Moscow. Thinking to regain admission to the social circles from which she had been expelled, uh, Dostopchina appeared at a Moscow ball given in honor of Nicholas I, only to be shown out. Nothing she subsequently wrote could reinstate her in the good graces of the emperor, and she returned to St. Petersburg only after his death. Now, even then, his displeasure continued to haunt her. Her request to present her daughters at the court of Alexander II, Nicholas's successor, was denied on the, on the grounds of the displeasure that she had caused with the forced marriage scandal. As, Dan, as scholar Dana Green cogently summarizes, Rostopchina made forbidden connections between the oppression of women, the oppression of Russians, and the oppression of Poles, patriarchy, autocracy, and imperialism, and paid dearly for it, end quote. Adding to Rostopchina's woes after this whole episode was the connection that could be made between her publication of a forced marriage and the intensified censorship that set in after the relatively, again, relatively speaking, lenient years of 1846 and 1847. Now this pub her publication was by no means the direct cause of this intensified censorship. And yet from that perspective, it made the forced marriage scandal look like an impetuous, ill-considered gesture. Even as it demonstrated the power of a woman's pen, the ensuing scandal and its consequences could be seen as supporting the prevailing bias that women were willful, lacking in judgment, and thus in need of close male supervision. In the wake of the scandal, Banished Justopchina continued to write po poetry and prose. She remained a writer undaunted. Uh, she also continued to divide, define herself exclusively as a representative of the golden age of poetry, even after the culture of the time took a different turn. Russian society and culture were undergoing a major change. Aristocracy no longer held sway over the arts. Social-minded critics grew increasingly strident and Rostopchina came into ever sharper discord with proponents of civic-minded prose prompted by a mixed class of the intelligentsia, the educated non-nobles who steadily intensified attacks on cultural emblems of the first half of the 19th century, Rostopchina among them. Rostopchina adamantly refused to align herself with this new current and continued to engage in bitter polemics until her death from stomach cancer in 1858. 
And here's a slide of, um, this is a, an, an announcement of a four volume collection of her works published in St. Petersburg, 1856. The last volume came out in 1859, already after her death. Now, as we look back, we see Ristovsh not turning a, a prevailing stereotype to her own advantage, using conventional notions about femininity to split politically dangerous poem past the censorship. In a way, sort of like using wide rustling skirts to smuggle contraband. This is a strategy that she had also used more broadly to gain a place among leading poets of the time as she played up a conventional feminine identity that helped her gain acceptance as a poet. The same time, however, there was a painful vulnerability that she incurred as well. Um, this sort of feminine persona that she cultivated threatened to activate gender biases that led to weak or inattentive readings of her poems. Um, the irony and self-distancing she invested in poems about herself and other women were too easy to overlook by readers who, again, took what she wrote at face value and read the poems as confirming stereotypes rather than challenging them. And we see that we saw this happen um, you know, with, with the poem that she sent to the Northern Bee. So that what happened was we can see that women who tried to contravene prevailing gender biases and actually got their poems published could be sort of read back into their place by readers who read their poetry, who readers are blinded by gender biases and read their poetry as if they were these flighty women who couldn't write. So it's just this terrible uh, sort of impasse that women ended up in. Now this could be entirely unwitting, unconscious, not not you know not intentional. We saw it with the with the Northern Bee episode, uh, the censors and the editors weren't trying to put down women. They just thought, oh, that's a great poem. We're gonna publish this. Is, you know, we'd have this in our in our. So it was completely un, unwitting. At the same time, however, and this is where I'd like to uh, bring us to uh, toward, towards the twentieth century. Um, this could be done intentionally in order to. Um, to, to, to put women down, to put women, uh, to get women out of the mainstream, to uh, make their poems seem less powerful or less interesting than they actually were. So that even after they achieved publication, women could still uh, be read in a way that minimized their accomplishments. And so let's quickly just jump for a few minutes into the early 20th century. So we see, um, if we look at the Russian trajectory of Russian literary history, remember we started with the golden age of poetry, then we went through the period of prose, the rise of the, of the Russian novel. As we get to the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, poetry, the golden age of poetry that had been forgotten is now, uh, poetry is now replaced. It's again, um, the retains its pride of place on the literary arena in a period called the silver age of Russian poetry. Golden age of poets have been sort of forgotten a little bit, uh, are once again revered. They're seen as models and sources of inspiration. An interesting change in the literary landscape was that many more women are now starting to write and publish poetry. Many more women want to be poets. Um, this occurs often under very heavy male mentorship and I hate to say this, but some pretty heavy sexualization as well. Now here we see that even as men poets of the 19th century re were reinstated and regarded as important models, women poets of that period remained by and large unsung. Their history was sort of forgotten. There's a bit of an erasure going on there. Mr. Chena was, as I described already, was a recognized poet of her time who published side by side with leading writers of the day. Um, she was not reinstated in this poetic pantheon. Indeed, a male poet of the early 20th century, this is Ladislav Hadasevich, if any of you know Nina Berberova, that was her husband, um, wrote two disparaging essays devoted to Ristipchina in which he described her as a frivolous socialite, an empty headed beauty who wasn't much of a writer at all. Um, in one of these essays, he refers to the poem of forced marriage and um, the only reason he refers to it is to maintain that Ristipchina had no intention of writing subversive poem, that she was completely unaware of its allegorical dimension, and that its political content had been read into the poem by her readers. In other words, um, this was a conscious effort to put the woman poet back in her place and not to give her credit for what she had actually accomplished. Um, 
So, but I'm trying to hope you say she, uh, little by little now, uh, Mr. Pichon is become, is studied more. Uh, we're, pre we're learning to appreciate more and putting her back into Rus Russian cultural history where she belongs. But I think it's time now for questions. I hope, um, I hope that you have some things to comment or ask about. I've had to go pretty quickly. So there are all kinds of places I'd be happy to fill in. Thank you, Olga. Uh, it's always interesting to consider the intersection of gender and politics and, uh, you know, nationalism uh, sort of all wound together in this time period. Uh, so if uh, folks have any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A. Um, I'll give everybody a minute to sort of digest what we just heard. And uh, yes, please type your questions into the Q&A and then we can we can start answering them. Who distract people from coming up with questions, but I also want to say I like what Amy's point about how closely interrelated everything is. I mean, it was, you know, whether it was Europe or Russia or any time period. But I also want to say the relevance of the way some of these biases that I described continues to work. I mean, however different that period was from our own, I think the way the biases were formed and operated are still very much the way our own biases are formed and uh, put into practice so that um, I'm gonna say those, those, are, those are relevant. In other words, I guess human biases have similar functions. The whole idea of, you know, I'll see it when I believe, I'll, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. In fact, it's kind of gonna be flipped. I'll, I'll see it, I'll believe it. When I, so I'll believe it when I see it, I'll see it when I believe it. Mm -hmm. So if you believe women can't write, that's what you see. But I think there's some questions there. Yes, uh, so we have our first question um, from Philomena. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, do we know just how purposeful and aware her intentions actually were in writing her poem? This particular poem? Mm -hmm. um, well, cats have inside her brain, but if you look at it, first of all, uh, the, the things that she removed from, the fact that she had just been in Krakow and she wrote this poem, the fact that she's dedicating it to Mitzkevich, uh, who's the great singer of Polish liberty, um, the fact that she sends it for publication after the Krakow revolution, uh, all of that really points to the fact that, and again, Mitzkevich was hugely admired by Russian romantic poets at the time as well. So all of that I think really does point to the fact she, she knew what she was doing. And in any event, none of her leanings or politics, her own proclivities were leading towards a publication such as the Northern Bee. This was a really provocative act and in fact, uh, there are different stories describing it. Uh, by one account, uh, she was in Italy at the time where the Russian writer Nikolai Gulga also was. And they said the two of them hatched this little plot together just to show that the censors were so stupid they'd never catch on. Um, that's hearsay, I don't know if that's fact or not, but I think we have very strong evidence that she knew exactly, that she knew what the Northern Bee was. So she knew mm -hmm. what she was doing. It's dangerous, it's a very risky business. Yeah. But, but she did it. <laughs> and, uh, and to follow up uh, to that question, uh, did she write other similar kinds of, of critical poems that you know of? Yes, you know, it's, uh, I love these questions like this. Yes, thank you for asking that as well. Um, one thing that happened to her is when her first, when that uh, first set of, of her poems came out in 19, 1841, um, the huge variety of poems that she had uh, no, I think I'm through. Wait, so I'm, so I'm straight for the question. Never mind. Let me go back to the question, and I'll talk about this. Was um, she wrote a lot of different poems, a lot of which were directed at social criticism. She wrote at the very start of her uh, career. She also wrote political poems, uh, following up on Pushkin's example, who wrote uh, poems dedicated to the Decembrists from the Decembrist movement. Uh, she similarly wrote an, an anonymous poem, uh, poems about that, a political poem uh, supporting the Decembrist movement. Uh, she also wrote a lot of poems that were, contained social criticism that was pretty clear. Uh, she also wrote, you know, poems about nature, about uh, art, about, um, you name it, she wrote about it pretty much like any male poet did. And one problem that happened is when Pushkin and some of his friends were just starting Russian poetry, and we have Pushkin's letters discussing with some of his friends, do you think, is it okay to write about, about the ballroom? Can we include ballrooms in poetry? Is poetry too lofty to have these day-to-day -day activities? They were still trying to figure out what to do in their genre. And they decided, yeah, of course, it's part of our lives. We can describe ball, the ballroom in our poems and they go ahead and do it. Uh, when Rostopchina does that, 
uh, suddenly the, the critics, one of the major critics, Belinsky, looking at her collection uh, of 1841 says, oh, well, she's just changed to the ballroom. She has three poems about the ballroom, like hundreds about social criticism and you know, nature and everything else just like that. But somehow that gets singled out. And then worse yet, it gets repeated over and over and over again, despite the fact that hundreds of poems testify to the contrary. And the other, I didn't have a chance to say, the other fallout from her assuming this sort of feminine guise to project, to say what she wanted to say, to project criticism, to um, present herself, is that even a sort of feminist critics who were looking at Russian women poets ignored her because they thought she was too feminine. They didn't see past her guys were just, you know, this is a while ago and like we're, we're now breaking through that, but um, it was, a, it was a, what we call now a feminine masquerade that uh, stood her in good stead, but also damaged her. So it's a mixed blessing. But yes, yeah, so although she didn't write such overtly po political poems anymore, she did have a lot of social criticism and prose as well. She also wrote uh, prose essays, prose stories, and one novel called The Fortunate Woman. Great. Uh, so Beth would like to know, uh, as Nicholas is the grand, uh, was the Grand Duke of Finland, uh, do you know of any female Finnish poets uh, that were struggling around this time to be published? Alas, no. I, I don't know Finnish, and I don't know the history of Finnish literature, so I wish I did. Do you, do you happen, does the person ask the question have any information on that? Yeah, perhaps, uh, perhaps Beth, you, you have some insights to that. Um, unfortunately, I don't have, a, have an answer either. Um, Nope, she doesn't have any knowledge either. <laughs> so she was hoping, uh, but maybe we can, uh, you know, maybe that's another topic for another time, you know, uh, you just, you never know. So um, this is an interesting question from Jim. Uh, Nicholas I was a devout believer that orthodoxy was the foundation of mm -hmm. Russian values. Mm -hmm. And uh, did Rostovicina share that view? Well, okay, so this this takes us into a lot of, that's a really good question, very rich also, like all the other questions, they're, they're big ones. Um, part of that viewing of, of the uh, of orthodoxy was also the, included the place of the woman uh, in the, you know, in the way she is described, and that certainly had uh, repercussions. Wait, what was the question again? So it was the, the did, 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 did she, she was, share the view that uh, really that orthodoxy was the foundation of, of Russian values, or did she sort of push back against that at all? Or um, yeah, I think I think she, that was probably part of her views, but I wouldn't say it informed her views entirely. Um, in fact, she broke with a lot of that. I mean, she had I think it's not clear the paternity of her children is under question, and she led more of the life of a society woman in that sense. Um, there is also the issue, but to add to that, in, in the sort of history of women's writing, there were some women who attached themselves specifically to religious values in an effort to avoid sexualization. That was one thing I haven't mentioned in the talk, it was haunting women all along. The minute you show up in public, ah, you're this available woman, you're this, you know, don't disgrace the family name, even publishing, just you know, words on a page, just get family, you're appearing in public, appearing in public had this sort of desultory aura to it. And so some, some women, one, one way women try to avoid that kind of sexualization was to attach themselves to um, you know, sort of more religious views to align themselves with imagery from say the Virgin Mary or with maternity, motherhood was another way you could try to avoid that. So that did feed into it, I think maybe less for Stupchina than for some of the other uh, women of the time. And also see all these different approaches also kept women from uniting, you know, the men poets out of their clubs and places they got together, their sort of brotherhoods, they could exchange, they'd be very different, like say the Lake Poets in England, you have very different ideas, we could talk about them, get together, the women tend to get polarized, they tend to be sort of at odds with one another, and uh, some women didn't like it as much enough for what she was doing, because they thought she was, you know, setting them back by acting like a frivolous woman. Um, so it got very complicated, but absolutely that religious image was one that some women shared, although not as much enough. Sort of uh, not much has changed throughout the years, if you think about it, and sort of pitting women against each other rather than giving them opportunities to come together and, and unite for for you know whatever reason. And uh, you know it's it's interesting to watch those trends throughout throughout history. 
Absolutely, and it works for other minorities as well. You know, um, I recently watched uh, New Yorker Live had a, a, a little uh, show with Amanda Gorman and the uh, playwright Jeremy Harris speaking. And they were talking, he was talking about the erasure of what American Blacks had accomplished earlier. There'd be like, a, you know, this huge you know, successes in theater or on Broadway. And then suddenly that's all kind of, it's erased. And then he said, he had to keep, so you have to keep starting over and over again. We see this happening with, with the Russian women, what they accomplished in the 19th century kind of gets erased and they have to start all over again in the 20th century. So that's there. Mm. And also, um, let's see, I had another example. Yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that. But yeah, a lot of these biases are sort of repeated over and over again of the same problems. So it applies to any minority, I think. Oh, the other thing is exceptionality. Yes. But there's this just exceptional, one other woman poet, or the only ones mentioned were ever mentioned in the 20th century. And they're okay because they're the exception, the exception that proves the rule. We have these two women, 20th century is Tataeva and Nachmatova. The exceptions of privilege, the exceptionality is a way to show that, well, see, they're not like other people of their kind, whether it's gender, race, or whatever else. So that's what I mean when I say these patterns of bias, repeat and stereotyping repeat themselves with pretty similar effects. Absolutely. Um, I think we have one more question. Uh, is she read or studied today? And is her experience considered a cautionary tale at all? Probably yes to all of the above. Um, she is gradually becoming recognized. Um, again, women's studies are taking off a little bit. There's a problem there too, because the whole, the whole uh, debate about whether we should study women separately and have courses on women's writing versus, or try to mix them back into the culture of their time. I'm, I think it's good to do both, but I think it's important to see them in the culture of the time because you see how they all inter the interactions are so important. Um, that's so it's like a cultural history. Um, but yes, uh, there's there's some translations of these women coming out now, and a description has gotten not very much, but some very high quality scholarly attention in Russia, which seems completely blind to gender and is really looking at you know the mastery of the poems themselves, which adds in, a, in an important dimension. Um, as far as cautionary tales, I think in some ways, I personally see it as a cautionary tale to scholars, uh, including myself, and that we're not immune to biases. Like when I think, oh my goodness, how many of us were reading her? Oh, you don't have to read her because she's a frivolous woman. We're gonna, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna resuscitate people like Pavlova, who you know seemed mas, you know, was reviled for being too masculine and not feminine enough, but she wrote these wonderful poems. And letting this feminine masquerade that Rastip Chana adopted to blind us as well. We're supposed to be pushing through that. And so being the cautionary tale, I think, is very good for all of us scholars, I mean, maybe for everybody in the world, of um, how easy it is to be blinded to something. Even when we think we believe or we know we're pushing past a bias, we get sucked into it. And it's the unconscious biases, again, race, gender, ethnicity. Uh, it's the unconscious biases that get us down. We're conscious of it. We may think, oh, I'm a rotten person. I think that way, at least I can fight against it or I can try not to do that. But when you sort of slip into it without realizing it, that's, that's, when, it's, that's when it's bad. So it's good to try to bring that to our awareness. I hope that answers your question. I... <laughs> well, thank you. Um, trying to see if there's any more questions that came in. So in the chat, um, you know, for, for those who would maybe like to, uh, explore more uh, Russian uh, female poets. Um, were there any other female authors of note at this uh, that were being published around this time? Yes, yes. Um, in fact, one of uh, uh, Pavlova, a nice easy name, Pavlova um, Karolina, was sort of uh, uh, at odds with his Stepchina. Uh, and she, excuse me, some of her things have been translated. The translation is a little bit shaky, but if you can read Russian, that's great. She wrote some very wonderful poetry and, and prose as well. And she was at, she was at odds she had a, a with, with his Stepchina precisely because of how to pro, you know, pro, project your um, but uh, so I could maybe start with those two. Those are probably the leading ladies. And you know, gradually now there are more and more histories of, of Russian uh, women's writing that are available that have, uh, uh, in fact, have little anthologies with uh, history of Russian ri women's writing as anthologies of poems written at that time. So you can kind of look around through those and see what, what grabs your attention or what speaks to you. 
Um, it's surprising how very many poets there actually were, but they weren't recognized. Often they were shunted off just feminine, female women's magazines and things. So they never did enter the mainstream early on, uh, but gradually we're sort of recuperating that. Um, so in my book, I sort of talk about the 19th century and the early 20th century and just how some of those dynamics played out, but it's not a history of, of the writing. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I believe that's it for our questions. Uh, as I mentioned, the, this is being recorded and, and will be available on our website in about a week. And um, I do want to mention, since um, you know this is all about women, uh, that at our poetry reading next week, uh, Prime, the majority of poets being read are women, um, and there's a good chunk of contemporary female poets um, that will be read well. So, um, yay, women! <laughs> so, thank you all for for joining us today, and thank you again, Olga, for your wonderful insights.